Today I'm giving you a detailed plain spoken review of the South Korean anti-drone laser defense system. The kind you've seen mounted on an armored vehicle with a boxy turret and a cylindrical emitter. It may look simple from a distance, but under that armor there's a tightly integrated stack of technologies. Precise gimbal stabilization, fast servo control, computer vision tracking, sensor fusion across visible and infrared bands, thermal management for sustained shots, and a power system that buffers big spikes in demand. I'm going to focus on what actually matters if you were evaluating this for real use, what it can and can't kill, how quickly it does the job, how weather affects it, what the crews need to operate it, how much it costs to buy and keep running, and where it sits in a layered air defense strategy. Let's start with the heart of the system, the laser itself. Effective power on target is a combination of output power, beam quality, and how steadily the system can hold that bright spot on the same point while energy builds up. In the class we're talking about, you can think in tiers. Lower outputs in the tens of kilowatts are already enough to cause structural failure on small quadcopters by chewing through plastic or composite propellers and by damaging the flight controller or battery casing. As output climbs into the higher tens of kilowatts, the time to disable a small drone shortens noticeably, and there's some margin for slightly larger or faster targets. Real-world engagements depend on how well the turret keeps the beam locked onto a vulnerable component. The South Korean turret shows quick, damped responses when it slews and settles, with minimal overshoot, which is exactly what you want for a stable spot on a moving target. Now, how long does it take to down something? Against a typical commercial quadcopter with composite props, if the operator aims for a rotor arm or a prop blade, you're looking at a handful of seconds, often less if the target isn't maneuvering. Aim for the battery or the flight controller and you may add a few seconds, but the effect is more decisive once the heat soaks through. Fixed wing mini UAVs are tougher because they present different angles and move faster. So the tracking algorithm has to lead the target and keep the spot glued to a small region of the skin or tail. In the demonstrations I've analyzed, the tracking box stays sticky on moderate speed targets out to practical CUAS ranges, which is what matters for perimeter defense of bases, depots, or convoys at halt. All directed energy systems share a set of physics penalties. Moist air, haze, dust, and smoke can scatter or absorb energy, reducing effective range and lengthening kill times. Turbulence near the ground can jitter the beam or distort it slightly. This system does not magically break those rules. In clean, dry conditions with light winds, it's very crisp. In humid or dusty air, you'll see the operators compensate by closing the engagement distance or holding the beam a bit longer. Night operations benefit from the infrared sensor channel, but low-level turbulence can still stretch the dwell time. None of that is unique to this platform, it's the shared reality of fielding lasers in the lower atmosphere. Thermal management is the next big pillar. A laser that fires once isn't useful. A laser that can fire repeatedly with short pauses is... Look closely and you'll notice the panels, louvers, and the size of the turret ring hint at a modular cooling loop, pump, heat exchanger, and radiator area sized to support bursts of multiple engagements before the system needs a longer cooldown. That's the sensible sweet spot for base defense. Lots of short shots rather than long continuous burns. If you plan to fight prolonged swarms, you still need doctrine that rotates two or three shooters. Or you integrate soft kill tools like RF jammers to thin the herd while the laser picks off stubborn stragglers. Let's talk about the kill chain. Detect, track, identify, engage. As a vehicle mounted unit, it can operate in two modes tethered to a short-range low-altitude radar or a local command system. It receives cueing about bearing and elevation and then snaps the optics to the handoff point, letting the electro-optical infrared package do final identification and precise aim. Or it can run more autonomously with its own optical search, which is perfectly fine for a smaller perimeter but naturally limits the surveillance volume. For serious facility defense, a network of two or three sensor nodes feeding one or two laser turrets is the configuration that gives both early warning and kill capacity. It's not just about seeing farther, it's about not wasting thermal budget hunting for the next target. 
Cost per shot is where lasers demolish traditional interceptors. There are no missiles or shells to replenish. The marginal cost of an engagement is electrical power plus some wear on the optics and moving parts. That means after you've paid for the system, training, and spares, the cost of repelling frequent nuisance drones collapses compared to launching a short-range missile or even firing programmable airburst rounds. That's exactly why these systems are suddenly so attractive for fixed-site defense, the economics finally. Favor the defender when the attacker's airframe costs a few hundred dollars. Safety and accuracy are often underappreciated. A laser's straight-line geometry means no shrapnel raining down on friendly assets or neighborhoods. The system still enforces safety volumes and interlocks. As soon as the tracker loses confidence, the beam cuts off. Operators practice with low-power boresight lasers to align the optics and confirm aim points, and the engagement laser operates at wavelengths, chosen for a balance of atmospheric transmission and detector sensitivity. If you're protecting a facility near populated areas, this precision is a compelling advantage over kinetic options. On the human side, the interface is exactly what operators need during a high-tempo watch. The display fuses visible and thermal video, overlays a tracking reticle, shows an estimated range if the system has it, and provides clear feedback on whether the beam is armed or firing. Crews can run the system with a gunner at a console and a driver operating the vehicle, or they can remote the console to a sheltered position. Acoustic and thermal signatures are modest. There's no recoil, no muzzle blast, and very little to give away your exact position beyond the visible beam and the turret movement. That's a tactical benefit when you don't want to advertise your defenses. Power is always a concern with high-energy lasers. The solution here is a hybrid architecture. Vehicle alternator or a diesel generator feeding a buffer of batteries or capacitors to handle the brief surge when the beam lights up. You don't need continuous megawatts. You need short windows of tens of kilowatts with clean power quality and a cooling system that can pull the heat out between shots. The cabling and base ring size on this turret match that philosophy. As long as logistics plans include fuel for the generator and a maintenance schedule for the cooling loop, availability stays high. Maintenance focuses on three areas. The laser source modules, the protective window at the front of the turret, and the cooling system. The optical window accumulates dust and salts in certain environments, which lowers coupling efficiency and increases back reflections, so scheduled cleaning matters. The coolant loop needs periodic checks for flow rate and leaks, and the pumps and fans have finite lifetimes like any mechanical system. Software updates are not just nice to have. The tracking algorithms and classification libraries directly affect how quickly operators can lock and hold unusual targets. So a program that pushes regular updates will keep performance improving even if the hardware doesn't change. I want to frame expectations honestly about swarms, because that's the hard scenario everyone asks about. A laser can only burn one spot at a time. If you face dozens of simultaneous drones, you either need multiple shooters, or you combine tools, jammers to disrupt GPS and control links, radar-guided airburst munitions to break up dense clusters, and the laser is the precise finisher for the drones that get through. This is called layered defense. In that architecture, the laser's role is perfect. It is the cheapest, cleanest, least collateral way to remove the last few threats without ripping holes in your own buildings with gunfire. Now the question you've waited for, what does it cost? Exact figures are sensitive and vary with configuration, but we can talk in sensible bands based on peers in the market. A single turret with electro-optical infrared sensors and the power and cooling modules to run it typically prices in the low to mid millions of dollars. Add integrated radar, a dedicated command post, hardened communications, and a military vehicle platform, and you're easily into the higher single-digit millions for a complete mobile package. If you scale up to higher outputs, expand cooling, and network multiple shooters and sensors, a site-wide system with several nodes can cross into eight figures. The big picture, though, is that once you buy in, the price per engagement plummets. Over a few years of frequent interceptions, the total cost of ownership begins to look better than repeatedly stocking interceptors or ammunition. 
especially when adversaries are throwing cheap drones at you to bleed your inventory. Where should a buyer place this system? If you're defending ammunition depots, fuel farms, command centers, ports, or power plants, the laser gives you the persistent, low signature option to swat down small drones day and night with minimal collateral risk. For city-adjacent sites, you'll define strict no-fire volumes to avoid lacing sensitive directions, 